following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We have the illusion or the experience that we are isolated. We go about through our lives <clears throat> inhabiting our own psychological country, which is this mind that we experience from moment to moment, through all our experiences, through our daily lives. And somehow we have found ourselves in the position of believing that we are separate from everyone else, that we have our own isolated mental world or psychological world within which we exist. And we call this experience self or I, myself. But all of the great religions and mystical traditions emphasize that this is an illusion, that this state of existence is not as it appears. And this is why throughout our many philosophies, there is an emphasis on developing the cognizance or consciousness of our collective mind at the first level. And beyond that, to experience the sameness or the unity of all experience, of all consciousness, of all degrees of mind, of all levels of mind. In the Bible it says, in God we move and live which is stating that there is a level of experience or consciousness within which we are all one, without any separation. And this is the truth of existence, the true level, without obscurity, that each of us is deeply connected with each other. But unfortunately, because of the psyche that our own hands have made, because of our own psychology, we've lost the ability to perceive it. And this is because of the nature of the psyche that we have made for ourselves. It is a psyche that is intensely self-obsessed. Obsessed with its own desires, with its own fears, with its own cravings, its own aversions. And that self-obsessed psyche is what we call I, ego, skandhas. If humanity were capable or made the effort to develop the consciousness, the free consciousness, the burata, or in other words, the tathagata garba, then the experience would naturally arise that we are all of us connected. We would feel one another. A spontaneous love 
would be present in our experience. And in that state of psychology or consciousness, there would no longer be war. There would no longer be suffering. Because we would understand, feel, sense, and perceive the feelings and experiences of others. We would understand our own actions' effect on others. And so we would change our behavior. From this point of view, it becomes evident that we need to understand something about our own psyche because it's from our own psychology that our experience of life arises. And this is why in that famous Buddhist scripture called the Dhammapada, the very first line of the scripture says, we become what we think. A man is what his life is or what his mind is, rather. A man is what his mind is. We become what we think. Our psyche has become what it has become because of how we think, of what in our mind we empower. And that psyche, in turn, is the cause of our contemporary world the psyche that each of us has as individuals. So this false consciousness or this false way of thinking was born because of desire. Because our own consciousness became entranced by desire. And from that illusion, from that hypnosis, or that identification with desire, the I was born, the ego. And that ego, which has many faces, results in karma, results in suffering, results in our experience now, feeling ourselves separate from everyone else, feeling separate from God, feeling separate from our own inner Buddha, from Christ, from Avalokiteshvara. And this I, or ego, finds its habitat in what in Kabbalah we call the four bodies of sin. The first one is the physical body, which is the body that we readily experience in our waking life. And the superior part of that physical body is called the vital body or the ethereal body. And this is the body of energy, or the body of chi. It's also called the vital body or the subtle body in Buddhism. But there are two other bodies of sin, which are the, the emotional or astral body, which is the body of our sentiments, And there's the mental body, or the body of the mind, which is where we process thought. These four bodies reflect our psyche. They are vehicles through which our mind acts. And our sense of self finds its habitat in these four bodies of sin. Physically, we experience our energies, which are the, the expression of the vital body. We experience emotion, which is the expression of the astral body. And we experience thought, which is the expression of the mental body. We call them four bodies of sin because this is where the I lives, the ego, within these four bodies, these four vehicles of the psyche. And it's through these four vehicles that the I, desire, acts. But the I itself is not these bodies. These bodies are vehicles. Your physical body is the vehicle of your will. And you direct it according to your will. And the same is true of your emotions and your thoughts. They are vehicles of will. The will, unfortunately, that rules over us is generally inconstant, 
contradictory and unconscious. So this becomes the definitive question. Where is our will? When we become angry, whose will is feeding that anger? What is the will of that anger? Anger only has a single objective, which is to inflict harm. When we become angry, that anger wants to harm. It wants justice. It wants revenge. It wants to fulfill its urge, its impulse. And the urge or impulse of that anger will process itself through our mental body or mind, intellect, through our astral body or emotion, through our vital body, through the energy that we have, and through our physical body, through our actions, through our speech. So you can see then that anger or pride or envy or gluttony or any of those seven major sins that we discuss will express itself through these four bodies. And this is an ongoing process. And when we learn to sincerely observe ourselves and pay attention to the state of our mind, we'll see that there's always a rising and passing, a constant stream of contradictory impulses, desires, thoughts, memories, worries, fears, cravings, and aversions. Contradictory wills, contradictory desires, confusion, uncertainty, doubt, fear, sometimes joy, sometimes ecstasies, great happiness. But there's always this inconstancy or contradictory nature. And this is because all of these eyes or egos are always fighting with each other to gain control over us. In one moment, we feel hungry and we want to eat, and we feel the urge to feed ourselves. But that desire can become infected with gluttony. And then we want to eat things that are not appropriate or not healthy for us. And then our vanity arises, and we think, no, 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 I shouldn't eat that because I need to lose weight. I need to take better care of myself. So we swing back and forth between contradictory impulses. In this tradition, we say that the ego is a multiplicity. And this doctrine is called the doctrine of the many, which has its roots in Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan psychology, and Egyptian psychology, both of which symbolize this doctrine of the many. We look at the ego as having a certain uh, loose kind of structure. There's not one I. There are millions. But we can group them in order to assist our understanding. We say the ego is three. We say it is seven. And it is legion. That ego is three because we have a demon in our mind, a demon in our intellect, a demon which is all of the egotistical, selfish, harmful, and otherwise um, inappropriate desires of the mind. We have the demon of evil will. We have the demon of desire. And these three are really the same as these four bodies of sin. The demon of the mind, the demon of the heart, and the demon of evil will. Or the demon of desire, rather. It's related to the physical and vital bodies. So these are the three traitors of every great initiate. Symbolized in all the great initiatic stories. In the life of Jesus, we know that we have the three traitors of Pilate, Caiaphas, and Judas. And these three traitors symbolize the three traitors in our own mind, in our own psyche. We have the three Maras, the three daughters of Mara, which are the three traitors. We have the three traitors of Hiramabif and many other great initiates. 
all of which symbolize in their life stories these three traitors. <clears throat> but those three are also seven. The seven inverted virtues, the seven capital sins. And these are, of course, laziness, gluttony, pride, avarice, greed, etc. But these seven are not individual faces either because they are actually a legion of an innumerable number of variations on these primary forms. In the Bible, there's the symbol of Jesus casting demons out of a possessed man. And when he approaches the man, he asks him his name. And the man says, my name is Legion. And this story symbolizes how the egos possess us because those egos are truly demonic, even though we lack the perception to see that. Yet this I is not all that is within, fortunately for us. We have a possibility to be redeemed, to be liberated from suffering, from mistakes. And that possibility is what we call the innermost, the innermost is our own inner monad, which is a Greek word which comes from monas, which means unity. And the monad is our own inner Buddha, our own inner spirit. In Hinduism, he's called Atman. But his, he actually, or she, this great conscious spirit which is within, has three aspects. Atman, buddhi, and manas. And these are a trinity, which is a unity. And this spirit or consciousness lies within us, this divine spirit, the innermost. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul describes these two fundamental aspects of our nature in many ways and throughout his writings. He provides different aspects or different ways of looking at our own psychology so that we can understand our true nature and overcome suffering. But the essential factor for us to grasp is to understand that there is a war that's being waged in our mind. We experience that whenever we face temptation, when we face any difficulty. We experience that war. When we feel the confusion or the uncertainty of how to behave, when we're faced with a problem or a difficulty and we feel that battle between doing what is right versus doing what we want. And this is the great conflict. We have a conscience. And by the term conscience, we mean a sense of what is right and wrong. A conscience is a portion of the innermost. It is a fraction or a spark of our own inner monad, our own inner Buddha. And the conscience is the consciousness itself. It is that which gives us the capacity to be aware to perceive, to be. The heart of the consciousness is the conscience which senses what is right and what is wrong. Unfortunately, our conscience has a quiet voice because it's weak. We haven't developed it. So when our desires arise, and our desires are very noisy and very demanding, we usually don't hear our conscience or we ignore it. In most cases, we know what's right and what's wrong, but we choose to ignore it, and we choose to follow our desires most of the time. And we think, because we have this psychological state of feeling separate from everyone else and separate from God, that we can get away with it. This illusion of separateness 
has given us the illusion of being independent of the law, independent of karma. And this is the tragedy of our situation. The forgetfulness of our inner being, of our inner Buddha. The forgetfulness of our intimate inner relations with all other existing things gives us this illusion that we can get away with whatever we want, especially if it's in our own mind. We have this illusion that we can think whatever we want without consequence, that we can daydream about whatever we want and there will be no consequence, that we can fantasize, we can plan, we can project, we can imagine anything and it will simply be our imagination. What we fail to realize is that each of these levels of our psyche has a level of reality. They are each energetic. And all energy cannot be separate from matter. And this is what Einstein presented to us when he presented his special theories. These theories state that energy and matter cannot be destroyed. They can only be modified. So the energy of thought, the energy of emotion driving our imagination, feeding desires, planning, fulfilling our cravings and and fulfilling our aversions in our mind, actually create results. Karma. The same is true physically, obviously. But we forget that. We ignore it. Because we have this illusion of separateness. There comes a time when that illusion starts to break down to some degree, when the conscience begins to become so hurt, when our consciousness is in so much pain because of being trapped in the ego, that the consciousness vibrates intensely, calling us to behave properly, to change. And this is why we come to studies like this. This is why people turn to religion. They feel that inner urgency, that call to the innermost. When the being or the innermost needs the human soul to work, to achieve its realization, it sends impulses, energies, and stimulates the consciousness to work, to awaken, to change. And this is what we call a spiritual inquietude. This is the driving discomfort that our consciousness feels. This discomfort of feeling stuck in suffering, stuck in filthiness, trapped. It begins to feel that life is pointless or that life is too painful. And this experience is very important. This recognition that we need to change. When the consciousness is in that position, what we're seeing is that conflict in ourselves. The conflict between the consciousness which wants to awaken and develop itself and the mind which wants to feed its desires. So what we see there is this great war. But unfortunately, what we often do not understand is that that war can only end in death. As in any war, someone will die. So in the war over your soul, Who do you empower? This is the question. Who will die? Who will live? The death of the soul, symbolized in the Bible by Cain and Abel, occurs when Cain, because of his desire, because of his jealousy, because of pride, kills the soul. Abel. And this is the battle that's waging now. 
in all of humanity, the battle between the mind and the consciousness. Looking within ourselves, we can see, if we're sincere, that we have these conflicting desires, that we have many animal impulses, many forces that are at work in our psyche, which are pushing us to fulfill their desires. What we need to clearly understand is that in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, to have redemption, to free ourselves from suffering, all of those desires must die. The soul has to be empowered and cleaned, made pure. And only in that way can we escape suffering. This is why in the Bible, Paul wrote, Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adult idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. What Paul is indicating is all of the egos. He's not talking about people outside of us. He's talking about the people inside of us. Each of those eyes of fornication, of idolatry, of greed, of vengeance, of jealousy. When he says drunkards, he's referring to egos that intoxicate themselves with sensation the sensations of anger, of revenge, of jealousy, of envy. When he's talking about thieves, these are egos that steal, steal energy, steal ideas, but mostly that steal consciousness. The answer for us lies within. The answer to this conflict is not outside. It is to come to know the different parts of the war, to really understand them, to know them, and to choose a side and fight. Our own innermost, our own inner Buddha, is fighting. That spirit within us is a great warrior, a great fighter who's fighting to redeem us from ourselves, who's fighting our own ego, fighting against our own mind in order to free the pure part, which is our consciousness. So our suffering is a result of our own past action. But it is there to teach us a lesson, to help us change. Our own innermost longs for his own development to become one with its own being. You see, our being has a being. Our inner father has an inner father. And this is reflected in the tree of life, the Kabbalah. The four bodies of sin are the four lower sephira on the tree. The, the second triangle, which is in the middle, is the monad, our own innermost. That triangle is a reflection of the superior triangle, which is the logos, Christ. Our own inner father longs to be united with Christ, to become perfect. But our own innermost cannot do that so long as one of his parts is imperfect, and that is you and me. Christ is love. Christ is light. Christ is law. Christ is impersonal, universal, divine. When we say impersonal, we mean that Christ is in all things. Christ is the vivifying geometry the vivifying fire of all life. In the heart of every living atom, 
burns the flame of Christ. And this is why the religions all state, in God we are one. Because it's true. And the heart of our existence burns the fire of Christ, which gives us life. But we are not cognizant of that yet. The innermost wants to become fully cognizant of that and thus to become perfect like Christ. So our own innermost needs us to do it. Christ, as this superior triangle, is a trinity, three in one. In Christianity, this is called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the Kabbalah, in Hebrew, they are Keter, Chokmah, and Bina. Chokmah, which is the second Sephirah, is the Hebrew word that means wisdom. Wisdom is Christ, the Son. Binah is a Hebrew word that means intelligence, understanding. This is the Holy Spirit of Christianity. When the innermost becomes a perfect vehicle or reflection of Christ, then the innermost has developed its soul, its two souls, into a perfect bodhisattva. Bodhi is the Sanskrit word for wisdom, which is the same as chokmah in Hebrew. And sattva means essence of or vehicle of. So a bodhisattva is a great initiate a great accomplished being when that bodhisattva is perfectly developed. So a bodhisattva then is an incarnation of Christ, a vehicle of Christ. And when that soul becomes perfect, it becomes vajra sattva, which means diamond soul, perfected soul. A diamond, of course, is a very beautiful gem which perfectly reflects light. But a diamond is made by being deep in the heart of the earth under great pressure and heat. And this is why we use the term diamond soul. Our soul has to pass through that great pressure and heat in order to become perfect. It's that pressure and heat of life that rids the soul of all impurity that transforms the coal into a diamond that which is black into that which is pure in the New Testament the innermost who is longing for that perfection is called neumatikon this comes from Two words, neuma and ikon. Neuma means spirit, breath, wind. And this is the innermost itself. Ikon or icon means image. What's interesting here is that this term hides a deep Kabbalistic symbology or symbolism. If the neuma, the spirit, of our innermost is an image, a reflection of what? Of the Holy Spirit, of bina, understanding, intelligence. So our own inner spirit, our own neumatikon, wants to be a perfect reflection of its spirit, which is bina, intelligence, and chokmah, wisdom. For that perfection to occur, the other aspect that Paul addresses has to be perfected. And this is called suchikon in Greek. And suchikon is related to psyche. So suchikon is the image of the psyche, the image of the soul. That's us. 
we need to become the perfect reflection of our own inner spirit. And this is what Paul is addressing in his writings when he explains the difference between what's normally translated as the natural man or the heavenly man and the terrestrial man. And these are the neumatikon and the suchikon, the two parts of ourselves, the soul and the spirit. So when these two are perfected and unified, we have then a perfect reflection of Christ, a bodhisattva. And in this perfection, there is no ego. There is no lust in Christ. There is no animal desire in Christ. There is no anger. There is no idolatry. There is no fornication no adultery, no covetousness. Therefore, we can see with perfect clarity that so long as we have those elements within, we cannot become a perfect vehicle of Christ. So our work then is to remove those imperfections. This is why the Bible states repeatedly that we need to work on ourselves. Paul again in Corinthians says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This necessity to acquire perfection is the single point of all religions. It is man in his egotistical misunderstandings that has corrupted these religions and stated instead that all we have to do is believe. But this is not true. The Bible does not say if we believe that we are saved. The Bible states no fornicator, no adulterer, no thief, no covetous person, no drunkard can enter into heaven. And we have all those egos. Thus, we cannot enter. Until those elements are purified from us, are gone, we remain where we are, suffering. Therefore, we need a plan. We need to do something. We need to act, to work. We can't just believe and sit back. If you look at your life and you look at the time you've spent believing in things, Did those beliefs make a fundamental change in your life? The things that make a fundamental change are the things you change. The works that you do, the acts that you perform, not just ideas. Therefore, we need telesis. Telesis is a Greek term. T-E-L-E-S-I-S. Telesis means progress that is intelligently planned and directed. It means the attainment of a desired end by the application of intelligent effort. This is the work of the initiate. We have a goal. That goal is to achieve the completion of religion, which comes from the Latin religare, which means to reunite the earthly with the heavenly, the suchikon with the neumatikon, the soul with the spirit to become perfect, to become one with God. This is our goal. And this goal has its culmination in the union with Christ. But that union is acquired through steps, through direct experience, not through belief. We can believe in whatever we want, But to actually do something, you have to act. The same is true of the creation of the soul and the awakening of the consciousness. 
A belief does not awaken your consciousness. A belief does not free your consciousness from pride. A mental affirmation that I will not be angry does not reduce or eliminate anger. It only hides from it. You cannot free yourself from anger by a belief. You cannot free yourself from lust by a belief or by a theory. You have to know the science. You have to know the steps. Fortunately, we have them. Fortunately, the science, the knowledge, the intelligence, the wisdom are within the, bo- the, the monad. Our being has the telesis that we need. Our being has the plan. Remember, telesis means to work with intelligence towards a desired goal. Our being, our innermost, can connect directly with intelligence, Bina, the Holy Spirit, with wisdom, Chokmah, the Christ. Thus, our being, our inner God, our inner Buddha, has the knowledge, the intelligence, the wisdom to direct us, to guide us. But we have to listen. We have to learn to listen, to hear that guidance. And this doesn't come through belief or through a theory. This comes through hearing it consciously. As a terrestrial person, here in our four bodies of sin, always being surrounded by our egos, our eyes, we have to learn how to discriminate the many voices that we hear in our mind and in our heart, to know how to act, to know how to behave, to tell the difference between the animal mind and the guidance of the being. And the only way we can do that is to awaken consciousness. We cannot do it through a belief or a theory. We cannot find the guidance of our being through memorizing books by belonging to a school or a group, by wearing certain clothes, by cutting our hair or not cutting our hair, by eating meat or not eating meat. None of these physical actions or inaction can bring us the guidance of our own inner Buddha. The only thing that can is for us to awaken consciousness from moment to moment, to be awake, to not be under the illusion of the mind, Once we begin to awaken our consciousness, to listen for the telesis of our own being, for that guidance to follow the steps of our own path, then we need to follow those steps to receive that guidance and to act. And how does that guidance come in the beginning? Through the conscience, through our sense of what is right and wrong, through knowing and performing what is right, even when it contradicts our desires, even when it contradicts what people tell us is right or wrong. We have to do what we know is right. We have to avoid what we know is wrong. But unfortunately, many of the schools and religions and traditions in the world do not teach in this way. They do not teach for us to rely on the being first. They instead teach that one should become a member of a certain group or one should believe a certain thing or one should wear a certain kind of clothing or adopt certain kinds of physical habits. There's nothing necessarily wrong with any of those things, but not one of them can give you the guidance of God. Only awakening your consciousness can do that. And unfortunately, in many of these schools and traditions, it's believed and taught that to become an initiate, you have to read and study a certain book or to be a part of a certain group or school or order or to get some kind of a degree or some kind of paper or pen to put on your shirt 
None of these has anything to do with real initiation. Real initiation has to do with the consciousness, with the soul, with the spirit, with the innermost. This is not something physical. To become an initiate, one has to work with the consciousness, coming to know the being. In the book Aztec Christic Magic, Samael and Vior stated about this a very beautiful paragraph, which I'll read to you now. He said this, To become an initiate, one has to endure a magical ritual in which the soul is momentarily liberated from the four bodies of sin and ascends towards the superior vertex of the triangle of life from where the soul can contemplate on one side, his physical animal life, and on the other side, his spiritual life. From that moment, the initiate lives with a secret longing within his heart to accomplish a mission of service for all men. From that moment, he knows that he is not an animal being, but the innermost incarnated within a body, and that God and the masters are with him in all the crucial moments of his terrestrial life. An initiate, a real initiate, never forgets God, his inner God, his inner being. And a real initiate has as their single goal charity service, selflessness, the urge to give, to help, to assist. To arrive at that, we need the science. That science is the telesis that we get from our being. But we need to study that physically as well. Not only receiving the guidance of our being, but training ourselves by learning the doctrine. To understand that, we need to grasp that humanity develops itself in two circles. All of us are now developing ourselves in the exoteric circle. Exoteric refers to that which is outside. That is the life of any person but this physical life and all the other dimensions through which physical, common people process themselves. This is the level of existence within which people are in ignorance and go about following all their animal desires and suffering intensely. The esoteric circle is a circle within which the masters of the White Lodge, the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, the angels, all live and exist and develop themselves. And these are the levels of initiation in the esoteric circle. And the esoteric circle has levels, many levels. It's not just a room you go in and then you're there. It is a long process of perfection. But speaking in broad terms, we say it's a circle. So in the physical world, we know that there are a lot of schools, a lot of societies, groups, lodges, churches, religions, temples, all of which are propagating their own teachings. And there are many books and lectures and pamphlets and websites and lots and lots of information. But unfortunately, it's all contradictory. It's all confusing. And it's all filled with theories and beliefs. Truly, it is a labyrinth. And all these schools are fighting with each other. In that exoteric circle, it's very difficult to find the real path. To find any school that's genuine. To find a teaching that is true. Yet, if we rely on the telesis of our innermost, the guidance of our conscience, 
our intuition. Our being can guide us to the school that we need, to the teaching that we need. Some are fortunate enough to find it, to find that pearl of great value, which was symbolized in the Bible. And very few recognize its true value and hold it as precious and sell all they own in order to keep that pearl. And this is what that parable is emphasizing for us. In order to have that pearl of gnosis, of knowledge, of the true path, we have to renounce everything else. And that everything is not simply physical. It's psychological. The entrance into the real path requires that we renounce our mind, the animal mind, the ego, our desires, our habits, our beliefs, and our theories. Commonly what happens is when a person encounters the true teaching, they reject it because it doesn't agree with their beliefs. It doesn't agree with their theories. But most of all, it directly contradicts their desire. The true teaching demands that desire die. And very few are willing to renounce desire and abandon selfish, egotistical cravings. Even some who do take the teaching, who value it, who love it, and who live it, come to a point where they encounter a desire or habit that they don't want to renounce. They hold on to that desire. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's their own image, their social image, or their self-image. Maybe it's lust. Maybe they don't want to give up fornication or adultery or money. So they leave the path. Many find the real path and withdraw from it because they don't have responsibility. So throughout this physical world, the wheel of suffering rotates and humanity suffers, searching, longing, wishing for the light, for change, but unwilling to renounce their own mind. The consciousness who becomes tired of the wheel recognizes the need for the ego to die. It's this point that when we begin to receive that guidance from our conscience, that telesis, that intelligent path, we begin to eliminate our slavery to the ego. And it's very simple. If the ego, if desire is what ties us to the wheel of suffering, then all we need to do is remove that ego, and then we will become free of the wheel of suffering. This is telesis, the plan or the action of the being to free the consciousness. That plan, that action is the guidance of the innermost, our own inner monad, our own inner Buddha, who in turn is receiving that plan, that guidance, that help from Christ, from the intelligence of Bina and the wisdom of Hokma. That plan is the process of initiation. And in synthesis, when we have raised the fire of Christ, the fire of the Holy Spirit, within each of our bodies, the serpents of Kundalini, then we have achieved it. We have achieved the union with the being. We have achieved the union with our own inner God. And that work is a work of initiation, conscious development, 
This is not theoretical. It is not a belief. It is experiential. It is something that we have to do consciously with cognizance, with awareness, with our own hands. But this work does not always culminate with the union of the innermost with Christ. There are souls who enter into this work, who raise these seven serpents, which can be seen over the head of Buddha, and they become then, the soul becomes united with the spirit. They become a Buddha. But that Buddha, in turn, needs to unite with Christ, and that's another work, a very special work. That's the path of the Bodhisattva. And that is another level. If our inner Buddha enters into the path of the Bodhisattva, then that inner Buddha is becoming united with Christ in stages. And this is what Paul addressed in Corinthians when he said, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. In synthesis, we can say that this quote from the Master Samael, he said, The innermost is the true man who lives incarnated within any human body and who all of us carry crucified in our heart. When the human being awakens from his dream of ignorance, he delivers himself to his innermost, who then becomes united with Christ. This is how the human being becomes almighty. So for us, we can see that this is a long work, but it starts here. Becoming conscious of who we are now. We see within us, we have an innermost who speaks to us through our consciousness. And we have within us Satan, the ego, the I. We are in the middle of a battle. And the battle is over the well-being of our soul. So it's necessary for us to fight, not only to fight against the ego, but to fight to develop the consciousness and come to know God directly, personally, consciously, not as a belief, not as a theory, but by experience. Someone once asked Carl Jung if he believed in God. He said no experienced God. And this is because he was making the effort to learn how to experience God. There is a great mantra that we can use in meditation in order to assist us in that development, to help us to reach that experience. And this mantra is Om Nis Aum. This mantra can be used at any time that we rest, we relax, we close our eyes, we forget all the vanities of the world, and we turn our consciousness inwardly to look at our inner consciousness, to dive within the soul. And we chant this sacred mantra over and over, diving into that as a doorway to our own innermost it's pronounced Om-ni-s-a-om. You can extend those vowels. For this to become effective, you cannot be thinking. You cannot be worried about life or fantasizing or daydreaming. You have to be conscious. You have to be consciously controlling your attention and relaxing. But through that mantra, you may have the experience 
of facing the one who's within. Your own inner Buddha who's waiting for you. Waiting to guide you. Waiting to take you along that path to liberation. A liberated human being is a master of himself. We are not. We are not true masters of ourselves. We are enveloped in pride, in fear, doubt, lust, greed. We are not masters of our own mind, of our heart, or of our body. So let us begin to develop it. A true master is not obligated to be here. A true master has will and can direct him or herself by will. We cannot. We are trapped in karma. We love the idea of will, of free will, and we think we have free will, and we talk for hours and hours about freedom, about liberty, about our own free will. But really, our free will is extraordinarily limited. We need to reflect on that. How much free will do we really have with pride in our minds, with envy in our minds? So until we awaken from this illusion of will, of independence, this illusion that we are separate from others and separate from God, we will remain a victim of our karma. We will remain dead to God and to our fellow men. And we'll just go from lifetime to lifetime becoming more tired, becoming more burdened and more pained. Eventually, all of us face this conflict within ourselves. The answer is the resolution to the conflict is to change to change ourselves. Who among us is satisfied? Who has happiness? Who among us has true serenity? We all feel in quietudes We all feel discontent. We're driven by impulses, by desires. And unfortunately, we seek to fulfill those desires and to quiet those inquietudes by searching outside of ourselves, getting a new job, getting a new place to live, getting a better spouse, getting a better education, buying some new thing that just came out, or buying some antique that we really want, all with this illusion that somehow, once we have that thing, we will feel content. Yet we never do. A few minutes later, we are discontent again. And there are those who think they'll find contentment through sex who are always seeking sexual experiences and believing that that is true happiness. And yet, they fail to realize that each time they seek a new sexual experience, they go a little further. They become a little more extreme. Till suddenly they find themselves doing things that are unspeakable, that are criminal, And if they're confronted with that, if, for example, they're performing some act which is illegal and they're caught, then all of a sudden they become repentant and promise to never do it again. And the same with many crimes. Many of those who are caught performing crimes say, oh, I've never done this before. I don't know what came over me. 
I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. That's a lie. They may believe it. They may be sincere in believing it. <clears throat> but so long as the impulse to commit the crime still exists in the mind, the crime will be committed again when the opportune moment arises. Unless that person develops sufficient will to listen to their conscience and to do what is right. Many criminals say, when confronted, I knew it was wrong. I knew I shouldn't have done it. I was being stupid. I'll never do it again. This demonstrates that their conscience knew better. And yet, they felt that they were separate from all other men and from God. And thus, they could get away with it. But the law is always there. The law within us is our own innermost. As Samuel M. Bior pointed out, the true initiate knows that he is never separate from God or from the masters, from the bodhisattvas, from the great angels. The true initiate knows that in every instant he is accompanied. So the true initiate knows he can never Commit a crime in silence. Any action that he performs is visible and seen by God, by the pure ones. This is worth reflecting on in those moments of temptation when we feel attracted to perform a certain action that we know is wrong or that we sense could be wrong. Do yourself the favor of listening to your conscience. In Colossians, in the Bible, there's a little passage which sums up this lecture, which I'd like to read to you. This is in Colossians 3. It says this, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked for some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all. And in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. Do you have any questions? When you talk about perfect soul and perfection, I mean, that's not a, um, an end word. Like, does every sphere have its own perfection as we progress up the tree of life? Well, the term perfection, we tend to think of it as an absolute term, as having an absolute definition. But actually, perfection is a relative term. It's relative to that which it's being applied to. For example, when you existed in the animal kingdom, you acquired perfection in that kingdom, and that gave you the ability to enter into the humanoid kingdom. 
And now it's your responsibility to become perfect in the humanoid kingdom so that you can enter into the superior ones, right? This is true of every level of the tree of life. Every level of consciousness. There is a state of absolute perfection, and that is the absolute. And that absolute state of perfection is called the paramatta satya, which is a perfected bodhisattva, perfected being. And any one of us can reach that. So just keep in mind, when you hear the word perfection, this is related to the term paramita in Sanskrit, which we gave a whole course about. And paramitas, although we use the word perfection for that, really it means conscious attitudes, states of consciousness, which have levels of development. So all of those perfections or paramitas that we need to acquire have many levels. Any other questions? Yes. What is the relation or difference between the conscience and torture and the cow? And what was the last one? Cow. The question is about the difference or the relations between conscience, intuition, and the cow. First of all, we can say that the term ka-om, which is K-A-O-M, refers to an aspect of our own consciousness, which is, in, in sort of a crude term, could be called the cosmic police. This is a part of our own, conscious, <clears throat> our own consciousness that records our every action, that witnesses and documents our every action this is on every level of the psyche, not just physical. That kaom is part of our innermost. It's closely related with gebra, which is the sphere of justice, the divine consciousness. But this is a part of our own inner self, our own inner constitution, which is the natural um, record of our activities. This part of our own self is objective. It's, what objective means is it's not egotistical. It simply records what's there, for good or bad, without judgment. It just records it. So our conscience is different. Our conscience is a part of the human soul, which is related with Tiferet. And the conscience is that spark of our own soul, the embryo of the soul, which is capable of receiving the impulses or the intuitive guidance that's provided to us through chesed and gebra. So they have a relationship, but they're not the same thing. The intuition or the conscience is that which provides the guidance. The kaom is that which records what we do, simply put. So you can say that the conscience receives the intuitive guidance of the kaom? Mm. No, I wouldn't say it that way. I would say that the kaom is the one that just records the action. The guidance comes from the innermost, the divine soul. Any other questions? Please. Um, I'm a little bit I'm curious about the tree. Um, you spoke about the absolute, and then you spoke about um, the animals and how we can evolve, um, how to evolve to um, uh, to our state, or, or we can say human. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, are, um, is it that we were all absolute and we lost our state and became like fallen angels or or is it that we we were um, I'm trying to think um, like are we like um, created and we're uh, like evolving to be absolute or were we already absolute and we just lost our state and we're trying to climb back like a ladder okay there's a ladder which is of course, in the Bible, it's Jacob's Ladder. 
And that ladder is the tree of life itself, the Kabbalah. And the rungs on the ladder are the dimensions or the sephiroth on the tree. In the past, to put it in terms of time, a spark of the absolute, a spark of the Ein Sof, entered into manifestation, driven by karma. That spark is our own inner Ein Sof, our own inner star. But that spark or that, that light unfolds itself in levels into the degrees of manifestation. And that's the structure of the soul that we've been discussing. So our consciousness has deep within it a connection back to the absolute, to the Ein Sof. But we're not cognizant of that. We're, un, we're not conscious of it. And that spark of our soul is not developed. When we perfect our soul, we can return back into that absolute existence as a perfected portion of that absolute. Otherwise, at the end of all the great cycles of existence, we're absorbed back the same way. So all that suffering was purposelessness, was purposeless, right? No point, because we didn't acquire the realization. So you're saying that um, at what point um, we were all absolute? Right, but without cognizance. What do you mean by that? That's the subtle thing that takes a lot of intuition to start to grasp. The reason existence comes to be is for the absolute to come to know itself. So all those sparks descend in order to come to know themselves, to perfect themselves, and to return back into that state of absolute existence so or non-existence. We were, we, we were all absolute, but because of our thought, our own desire of, of, of seeking out, and it brought us down, and then now we're searching to get back. Exactly. But the obscuration or the block is the ego, which is intimately related with karma. So until we free ourselves from that, then we can return back. This is a deep topic, and there's a lot of aspects, many lectures about it. But in general, that's the, the basic idea. So how do we know that we won't get back to that point again? I mean, like, let's just say that we, we finally make it, and then we're there, and then there's another thought coming in. Back to the it can, it can happen, and that's how the angels fall. Wow. They become enticed by desire. If you've read the book of Enoch, it's about that. Hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.